All right, a thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices, as we just sang in that first song, um, O Holy Night, and certainly um, we can find ourselves in a weary world today, and the hope of Jesus um, is the one thing that will cause us to rejoice, and we've been looking at each of these stories um, found in the gospel accounts of the thrill of hope that Jesus brings with his coming, the thrill of hope that comes with the awaited Messiah and his coming to earth. And um, so if you guys remember, we've been talking about Zechariah, we've been talking about Mary, and so today we're going to look at Joseph's story. We're going to look at Joseph's side, his account, um, kind of his perspective of uh, the coming of the Messiah. So we're going to be in Matthew's gospel today. Um, just an interesting thing to kind of note as you're turning there. Uh, Matthew's gospel focuses more on the kingly side. It focuses more on the Jewish side of Jesus. And so that's why it picks up um, predominantly with Joseph's account. Because uh, Matthew is going to tie in that genealogy that most of us skip at the beginning of his gospel. That genealogy is going to tie um, Joseph to King David and to his Jewish history. And so that's why we pick up Joseph's account here. And so today we're going to be looking at verses 18 all the way down uh, through verse 25 through the, the rest of the chapter. And um, so I'm going to, I want to quickly cover Joseph's story, and then I want to jump into some of the more uh, focused details about this coming Messiah today. So first I want to look at Joseph's story, and we're going to look at this real simply in two different ways. Um, starting in verse 18 and 19, we kind of have Joseph's perspective on uh, the situation, this unexpected situation that happens in his life. Let's read this. It says in verse 19, Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband, Joseph, being a just, and, uh, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. Okay, so let's just stop for a second. You guys were probably all familiar with the story, right? Mary was betrothed. Um, it was a little bit more than engaged, but not quite the full. They hadn't had their full marriage ceremony at this point. Um, but she was engaged, betrothed to a man named Joseph. And what we get from the text is Joseph was a just man. He was a good, righteous man trying to do the right thing. So his his uh, his. Uh, spouse, I guess, um, or uh, the one that he was betrothed to came to him and it it was told to her by the Spirit that she was pregnant. And so Joseph's like, I don't know what I'm going to do with this information. How am I going to handle this? Like, it's not mine. He's not mine. So what am I going to do with this? And so uh, the text tells us that he decided he made a plan, right? He decided that he was going to put her away quietly. He was going to divorce her quietly. He wasn't going to bring open shame. Now, now in that culture, Joseph could have brought her before um, the congregation could have brought her before the people and could have publicly shamed her for this. Um, but being a just man, he decided not to do that. And so we can really sum up Joseph's thoughts initially in this situation by saying, I'm going to do it my way, right? Joseph had a plan. He had an idea and his plan was to do it secretly and quietly put her away, divorce her and to not continue on with the marriage. Now I want us to jump down to verse 24. Because Joseph's perspective changes in verse 24. Verse 24, it says, Now when Joseph woke up from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him to do. He took his wife, but he knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. See, there's a change, right? Joseph went from, I'm going to do it my way, to I'm doing it his way, in verse 24 and 25, his perspective changed. He no longer is putting Mary away. He's no longer sending her away. He is going to marry her and continue to be her husband. And I think just quickly today, as we start to think about our own lives, I think a lot of times we find ourselves in the position of Joseph. Like, can you relate to Joseph's situation? Yeah, probably not the exact specifics of that. But can you relate to a situation where God is working and doing something in your story and initially you want to respond by saying, you know what, God, I'm doing it my way, right? I got a plan. I got it figured out. I know how I'm going to do it. I want to do it my way. 
Or when God shows up in your story, God asks you to do something that's just you're unexpected, that you can't figure out all the details to, do you respond like Joseph does later on in this passage and saying, you know what, I'm going to do it his way. I don't know how it's going to work out. I don't know how this is going to, what this is going to mean for me or my family or anybody else, but I'm going to do it his way. I think that's a good place for us to start thinking this morning. When God shows up in our story, how do we respond? How do we respond when God shows up in our story? But you see, for Joseph, maybe the most important part of his story happens between verses 18 and 19 and 24 and 25. You see, something happened in Joseph's story that changes his response from I'm doing it my way to I'm doing it his way. What happens is that God shows up in his story. A thrill of hope is presented into his story, into the story that seemed pretty hopeless. Joseph had decided and had come up with this plan that there was no hope left for salvaging this relationship with Mary. And so he was going to do the just thing and secretly, quietly put her away. But there was no hope. But yet there is a message of hope that comes even in this weary situation. And so I want us to, to take the rest of our time today and to focus in on this message that this angel comes to deliver to Joseph. And so let's back up in our story, and I want us to pick up in verse 20 and see what it says. But verse 20 says this, But as he considered these things, so as Joseph was thinking about his situation in life, right? Uh, I'm betrothed to this, to this woman, but she's pregnant now. It's not my son. What should I do? What am I able to do? How am I feeling? As he's considering these things, Things it says in verse 20. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. See, God showed up in his story. God is sending a message to Joseph even when he kind of had given up hope on things. God was sending a message to Joseph of an encouragement. And what was the message? The message was a message of hope. The God of the universe was about to bestow on humanity an incredible gift. Right? Do you see it there in the text in verse 20? It says that, that she's going to have a child, that she's going to conceive in her womb. She's going to have a child, and the, and the baby that she conceives is from the Holy Spirit. It's a gift from God to humanity. This was going to be the gift that humanity had been waiting on for ages and ages. This was the gift. And so today, as we, as we look at this passage, kind of our overarching theme today we're going to look at is that the gift of Jesus is the thrill of hope for the weary world to rejoice, right? The thing that's going to cause the thrill of hope in this weary world is that gift that came on that Christmas morning, that gift, that baby that was wrapped in the swaddling clothes and was laid in a manger. That is the thrill of hope. And it came, as no surprise to us, it came as a gift to humanity, right? And so today I want to focus on this, this idea of this gift that God presented to humanity. And it should be in this season, the idea of a gift should be pretty, pretty relevant to us, right? We are about to enter in to the gift exchange, gift giving season, right? How many of you guys have already received a Christmas gift of some sort as of today for, for this year? Has anybody got, already got some Christmas gifts? Coming in? Okay. Okay. So we're getting into that season, right? And I would, I would say in the next week, it's going to be in full swing, right? That, that we're in this gift-giving, gift-exchanging kind of mode. And one of the ways, I guess, that people uh, exchange gifts that has become very common in our, in our world today is by playing a game that most of us probably know it by the name of the White Elephant, even though in some places it's called Yankee Swap, other places it's called Dirty Santa, are you guys familiar with this game that I'm talking about? Um, essentially, it's this game where you just exchange presents, right? Um, and so I kind of got interested this week to figure out where did that name come from, White Elephant. Like, it was a very peculiar name for a, for a game where you exchange gifts. And no one really knows. There's a lot of, like, just kind of, like, 
stories that have been passed along. But the term has basically been in existence since at least the 1800s um, to refer to a less than desirable gift. So if you've ever played White Elephant, you know that one of the goals of the game is to stick somebody with a gift that they really don't want, right? And so what a lot of people do is they'll end up re-gifting things that they really don't have use for or someone had given to them, or they just trying to find the most obscene, obnoxious gift that they can find and then wrap it up in really pretty paper and hope that somebody opens that and has to go home with that gift. Um, According to legend, however, the tradition of a white elephant gift began long ago when the king of Siam, which is today uh, modern-day Thailand, gave an actual white elephant to anyone he disliked. He, so he would literally gift someone with a white elephant. Uh, and these rare white elephants were quite expensive to care for. Um, and also the white elephant was also a representation of the Thai culture and also the Buddhist cultures. And so you couldn't re-gift that. You couldn't put it to work. You just kind of had to take care of it, right? And so, um, so when, whenever the, the king didn't like somebody, he would give them this white elephant. And because of the culture, they couldn't give it away. They just had to take care of it. It was very expensive to care for, and they couldn't even make it work. It was just kind of this useless thing. Some of us have pets that kind of fall into this category. Any of you guys with me? It's like, man, that, that animal, I won't say what it is, but that animal just doesn't do anything. I just have to buy food for it all day. It just ends up costing me money. And then you have to take it to the vet. And if you've ever taken an animal to the vet, it's like, oh, man, like how expensive that is, right? And so he would give these as this gift. And then according to an 1873 article from the New York Times, the white elephant, which is an impossible to get rid of, it was possible, impossible to get rid of, but too expensive to maintain, would be an enormous financial burden in impoverishing the recipients. All right? Now, hopefully, when you're playing with your friends, you're not giving actual elephants to people that they have to take care of. Maybe that would be a great gift. You, you pick up a dog, you know, at the shelter, and then you wrap it up in a pretty gift and give it to somebody, and now they have to take care of it. Maybe you would stick somebody with that. Um, I don't know, right? But I know when you, play, when you play the game, right, when you play with your friends, you play the game, there's typically, most of us fall into one of two categories, right? So if you've never played before, basically everybody brings a gift, and you get numbers, and you go around, and you open a gift, Right? And so after the first gift has been opened, um, the next person up can either steal that gift from the person or they can pick a new gift and have that gift. And the game just kind of keeps going on as you trade and steal gifts and things like that until you get to the end. All right? um, so some people love to steal gifts. Right? They love just seeing what somebody else has opened and they're like, aha, I'm going to take that. And they love maybe just the thrill of taking something from somebody else. Maybe there's some regression and, and aggression that's been built up over the years, and they just, this is their opportunity to let it out. I don't know why people do that. But for some of us, we love the thrill of opening a new gift. That's, that's the category I fall into. It doesn't matter. I mean, somebody could have like $1,000 cash in a bag and open that as a gift, and I'm still going to pick the one that's under the tree. There's something about the allure of that gift and what's inside of it, the mystery of what's in that gift, that I'm going to go for it every time. And I'm so bad at this game, I always pick the biggest gift with the prettiest wrapping paper. I'm just drawn into it. I can't help myself, right? I'm a gift, I'm a gift opener. I love opening those new gifts. There's something enticing about that, isn't it? Like there's something that just draws us into this idea of gifts. When we see the sparkling gifts under the Christmas tree, when we, when we are gathered around and there's just this thrill around um, the mystery of what's in that gift. And so today in, in this text in Matthew, I want to look at this gift specifically. I want to look at three different aspects of this gift that we see here um, that God has given to us. And so the first of those is that as the gift, Jesus was determined before, before time that he was going to be the gift that we needed. Jesus was determined. Verse, uh, verse 20 and 21 says this. Uh, the end of verse 20 says, Joseph, son of David, do not fear and take Mary, your wife. We just read that. Um, which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. You see, this gift that was to come, this idea of bearing a son, was something that God had put into motion 
years and years before this moment. This gift was already determined. God already knew in His infinite foreknowledge and understanding what He was going to do to fix the problem of humanity. God already had a plan to send Jesus. Even before the earth was created, God had this plan in mind. He already knew that Jesus was going to be this gift. You see, where when Matthew says that she will bear a son, this was an echo back to what we looked at last week in Genesis 3.15, where God had promised that that, that because of the fall of humanity, God was going to send a Savior that was going, to, was going to make a way to restore that relationship. This was an echo back to the fall, to that moment when humanity broke that relationship with God. Here's something, if, if I was thinking about that this, this week, and if you just want your mind to be blown, think about this. When God created humanity, when God created the earth, when God created everything, God knew Right? What was going to happen? God knew the story. He didn't catch him by surprise. God knew he was going to have to send his son into the world to, to restore and to, to, to bring back what was broken. But yet God still, in the beginning pages of Genesis 1, still spoke the world into existence, knowing how it was going to turn out, knowing the brokenness that was going to come from that, knowing the cost it was going to mean to him to send his son. But yet God still sent his son like, if that doesn't blow your mind, just thinking about the love and the amazement of God and who He is and, and His purpose in all of that, it's just, it's, just, it's just unbelievable when we think about that. And so it should be no surprise to us that the name given to this child is going to indicate what He was going to do. He said that you shall name this child Jesus. We talked about this last week. His name means the salvation of the Lord. It is the... It is the Greek translation of the Jewish name Yeshua or Joshua, right? Which means Yahweh saves, God rescues. And this one that was coming was going to rescue humanity. He was going to be the rescue plan for humanity. You see, Jesus wasn't just a random child sent into the earth. He was determined. God had a plan that this child was going to bring salvation to the world. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, when Peter is talking, here's what he says. He says in verse 12, And there is salvation in no one else, and there is no other name under heaven given among men which we must be saved. You see, the name of Jesus is our only way to salvation. Jesus is the only way to find salvation. You see, Jesus was going to save his people. Jesus was going, to, was going to save his people from their sins. We can say it another way. Jesus wasn't just determined. God, Jesus was a predetermined gift that God had for humanity. Acts chapter 2, this is right at the day of Pentecost. Peter, again, speaking here in verse 22, says this. He says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. God knew from the beginning the gift that he was going to send to humanity. God had a plan from the beginning of this, of, of, of the brokenness of humanity of what he was going to do. And that plan was to send Jesus. Jesus was the determined gift. Jesus was determined. Number two, secondly, Jesus was declared. He was declared. Look at verse 22. All of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. This word fulfilled in there, whenever you see the word fulfilled, it's linking, if you see it in the New Testament, it's linking something that was said in the Old Testament to this specific moment. Okay? And so what Matthew is writing is he's saying that all of this that took place, the events of Jesus coming, the way in which he came, the place in which he came, was already spoken about in the Old Testament. And this was to complete or fulfill that. This word here, fulfilled, is in the passive voice in, in the Greek. And what that means is that it gives the idea that something was being done, something was happening, something was, being, was, was happening in this moment. And what was happening was Jesus was about to fulfill these prophecies. The, see, this gift had been told about for years and years and years before it was ever given. 
In fact, as we look at the Old Testament, there are over 350 prophecies about this child that was to come. In fact, there's a guy named Peter W. Stoner. Um, he was around, he wrote a book called Science Speaks in 1958. You can still actually get a copy of this online. Uh, I was reading through some of it this week. Um, they, they, re they revised it in 2005. Um, but he goes through in there and talks about, um, he, so he's a mathematics and astronomy uh, professor. And so he goes in and talks about the, the, the likelihood of someone fulfilling all of these prophecies that Jesus came and fulfilled and, and the likelihood of someone being able to do that. And so he made this statement. He said, if, if there was a person who by chance was able to fulfill just eight of these prophecies, of the 350 prophecies that came true by sheer chance, that would be one in the 10 to the 17th power. So that would be a one with 17 zeros behind it. That's the likelihood of someone just randomly being born and fulfilling just eight of the 350 prophecies that we have. To help us to understand that a little bit better, to put that into a picture for us to understand, he said, that's like taking silver dollars and you put an X on one of those and then you cover the state of Texas in those silver dollars two feet deep. Then you take a man and you blindfold him and you, and you spin him around and you drop him off out of a plane somewhere in Texas and that likelihood of him picking out that one coin with the X on it is the likelihood of someone randomly fulfilling just eight of the 350 prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. He goes on a little bit further. He says, if we add another eight to that, so if, if, if someone just randomly were to be able to fulfill 16 of these, the odds would go up to one in 10 to the 45th power. So again, that's a one with 45 zeros behind it. He said, if you want to get a picture of what that would look like, he said, you take all of those silver dollars again, right? If you took all of those silver dollars and you put them into a ball, right? The size of that ball would cover the radius from the sun to Neptune, right? So this is what it would look like, all of those silver dollars in a ball, the likelihood of someone just fulfilling 16 of the over 350 prophecies that Jesus came and fulfilled. And so I don't want to just stand up here this morning and, and tell you about all these prophecies. I want you to be able to see some of these for yourself. I want you to see some of these in our text, in the book of Matthew, some of these prophecies that were fulfilled. And so what we're going to do is we're going to take a couple of minutes. And I'm going to have four passages up here, four Old Testament prophecies, and then four fulfillments of those in the book of Matthew. Um, and I just want you to take a few minutes and just kind of read those. Um, read the Old Testament prophecy and then read the New Testament fulfillment of that. Um, in which we see that Jesus was declared. So I would encourage you, um, when you have some more time to continue to look, there's, like I said, there's tons and tons of these um, out there, different references to these Old Testament prophecies and then their fulfillment in the life of Jesus. These were just a couple of those to kind of get us thinking today. But Jesus was declared as the gift, right? He was spoken about by the prophets. He was spoken about by those in the Old Testament that was talking about the one that was to come. And then third, Jesus was delivered. This is the great news, right? Not only was, was he declared and told about, not only was he determined, but he was delivered. He was sent. Verse 23 says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. That is the hope of Christmas. It's not just that God would send someone, but that it was literally going to be God with us. God was going to wrap himself in flesh and come to be with us. The name Emmanuel here it emphasizes the nearness of God. Right? Christ's birth brought the infinite holy God within reach of finite sinful humanity. All right, listen to this. God came to live with us so that we could live with him. The son of God became the son of man that he might change the sons of men into sons of God. All right, let me just say that one more time. The son of God became the son of man that he might change the sons of men into sons of 
God. You see, the picture was not just that God was going to send one, but God himself, through the person of Jesus, was going to come and be with us, right? John and his gospel uh, picks up on this picture very clearly for us. In the gospel of John chapter 1, it says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? If we skip down to verse 14, it says, In the Word, right, Jesus, we know, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. That word dwelt among us is, is the Greek translation of the Hebrew word for tabernacle. You guys remember in the Old Testament, the tabernacle was the, was the portable presence of God. It was that tent where God's presence would dwell in the midst of Israel. And that was the picture of who Jesus was going to be, was that Jesus was going to come and dwell with us, God with humanity. You see, the first words we get about Jesus in John chapter 1 is that he was going to be with us. It's also interesting that the last words of Jesus before he leaves the earth, before he ascends into heaven, in Matthew 28, verse 20, most of us know this is the Great Commission passage, Jesus' last words before he leaves is this, And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. You see, Jesus from the beginning to the end is Emmanuel, God with us. God with us. I want, I, want, I want to read how Paul describes Jesus in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 through 20. And I just want you just to listen in for just a minute as we think about this gift of Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile all things to himself, whether on, on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. You see, this gift was the ultimate gift for humanity. This gift was the thrill of hope. And if, and, and if I may, I'd like to illustrate this one last way as we think about gifts as we close out today. I found this interesting this week. Uh, someone pointed this out to me and like the more I started to think about it, the more I kind of just started doing my little Bible nerd thing and just kind of dove into this. And so you'll have to just bear with me for a minute. I found this really interesting. If you don't, just kind of nod your head and pretend it'll make me feel better. Uh, but I found this really interesting. You see, when we think about gifts in the story of the Bible, there's one other place that gifts show up in a prominent way. Does anybody know? Where else does, does the idea of gifts show up in a prominent way in the, in the, in the Christmas story? Does anybody know? The wise men, right? The wise men, the three magi, the three kings, the three wise men come and bring gifts to Jesus. In fact, in Matthew chapter 2, verse 11, it says this, and I'm really excited because we're not covering this passage because uh, you may not know this, but the, the, uh, the magi or the kings did not show up in that, that nativity moment. They came much later in the story. And so I'm sorry to wreck your little nativity scenes, but they're probably not theologically accurate um, for that reason and many more. Um, also, let me just, I heard somebody say that this week and it just kind of got in my mind. Also, these pretty little stables that we have in mind is probably not at all what it was like. Um, anybody that's been growing up on a farm and knows what animals smell like, it was probably a lot worse than our little manger scenes. But the, the wise men were not there, but I love their story. And one of the things that really opened my eyes was when I looked at these gifts. Matthew chapter 2, verse 11 says this, And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. It says they went into a house, not an inn, so there's a little indication there too. And they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. These three individualized gifts. And when we look at each of these gifts, um, it's interesting to see how these gifts relate to who Jesus was going to be. I want to start in reverse order. I want to start with the myrrh. The myrrh. 
And this was a gift to represent the sacrifice that Jesus was going to be. Myrrh is a fragrant spice derived from the sap of a native tree near the, in the far Near East. Most notable with regards to Jesus' life, myrrh is the key ingredient in the mixture of spices that were used to prepare bodies for burial. Perhaps the wise men intended this gift as an indication of Jesus' humanity and the manner in which he would save his people, namely, that he would die for them. In John chapter 19, verse 39 and 40, it tells us this, Nicodemus also, who uh, earlier had come to Jesus by night, came to bring a mixture of, there it is, myrrh and aloe, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it with linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. This myrrh was to indicate what Jesus was going to be. Isaiah, speaking hundreds of years beforehand in Isaiah 53, verse 5, said the same thing about who Jesus was going to be. He says this, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. The murder indicated that Jesus was determined before the beginning of time to be our sacrifice to pay for the sins of humanity. Secondly, we look at the frankincense. Frankincense. This was used in offering. Jesus was going to be an offering. Frankincense is an aromatic gum resin uh, that is still widely used in parts of the Middle East and Africa today. It's produced again by scraping the bark off of the tree and harvesting the resin beads that have dried. And is burnt as an incense. Creates a strong, beautiful aroma. Frankincense may also have implied a connection to the temple worship of of the Old Covenant. Burning incense at the altar was a key part of the sacrificial system prescribed by God for the use in the temple and later in in the tabernacle and later in the temple itself. In Exodus chapter 30, verse 34 and 35, Moses says this, or the Lord says to Moses, Take sweet spices, stice and onyx and, and golemum, sweet spices with pure frankincense, of which there shall be equal parts. And make an incense blend as by the perfumers. Season with salt, pure and holy. This idea that Jesus was going to be an offering, a sacrifice acceptable to God. Jesus, the frankincense. And then finally we have the gold. Probably the one we're most familiar with, right? Gold, um, as was the custom back then, royals, um, when they would visit, they would bring treasured gifts. And as it was... Uh, Back then, it still is today, that gold was a very treasured commodity in the ancient world. But gold may have also foreshadowed another aspect of Jesus' ministry. Not only was he going to be a king needing uh, this gift of gold or representing by this gift of gold, but under the Old Covenant, the most holy place, the place called the Holy of Holies, right? When the Holy of Holies, when someone would enter in to this inner sanctuary in the temple, was the place that the priest would come and encounter the presence of God to offer an atoning sacrifice for the sins of the people. I want you to listen to the description of what the Holy of Holies was like. And this is found in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 20. The inner sanctuary was 20 cubits long, 20 cubits wide, and 20 cubits high. And he overlaid it with pure gold. He also overlaid it uh, overlaid an altar of cedar and Solomon overlaid the inside of the house with pure gold and he drew chains of gold across it from the inner sanctuary and overlaid it with gold. And he overlaid the whole house with gold until all the house was finished. Also, the whole altar that belonged to the inner sanctuary, he overlaid with gold. This picture that Jesus now becomes that place, that holy of holies. Jesus is going to become that place where man and God would meet together. Not, no longer did man have to go to a temple to offer sacrifice, but Jesus was going to come as that representation of that sacrifice. I want to finish what Paul says about Jesus in Colossians chapter 1. Verse 21, he says this, speaking of us in relation to what Jesus has come to do for us. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind doing evil, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. 
So the question for us today is God has given us this incredible, this ultimate gift. The question is, what are we going to do with the gift that he has given to us? Right? You see, for some of us, for some people here today, maybe that you've never really received that gift. Yeah, you've heard about the gift. You've come to church and you've, you've heard people talk about the gift. You've heard about the joy that the gift is brought by other people, but you yourself have never enjoyed the gift. It would be like someone giving you a Christmas gift and then you just putting it on a shelf and just kind of leaving it there. And I think a lot of times that's how we relate to Jesus, right? We have these moments, we have these valleys in life and we run and we say, yes, Jesus, we need you for just a moment. But yet when everything's good in life, we just kind of leave him on the shelf. We forget about the gift. We never truly open the gift. It's like we just put it on a shelf. And so today, if you've never truly accepted that gift, if you've really never opened that gift and experienced the joy inside of that gift, I'm going to be up front. I would love to just talk to you. It's not about a magic prayer. It's not about anything specific that you say. It's about a relationship with him. And I would love to talk to you about that this morning. But for a lot of us, we've received that gift. We've opened the gift. We've experienced the joy that comes from this gift, from this gift that was determined, this gift that was declared, this gift that was delivered. We've experienced the joy of the gift. And if that is us today, right, our goal now is to share that gift with those we come in contact with. You see, as we, as we all know, we're about to go to meet with a bunch of people we may not see a lot of times throughout the year. We may be having opportunities to be around people that um, we not, may not see um, very often. And so what will we do with that gift, right? Um, it's like as we think about Christmas gifts and we think about those gifts, right? Uh, whenever you get that gift, right? If you remember back um, at some point in your life, maybe you got a gift that you just really, 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 really been waiting for, Right? And you open up that package and you get that gift, right? And you don't just, you're not content just to play with that gift or just to enjoy that gift, right? You want to tell everybody you know about that gift, right? I remember as a kid growing up um, in elementary school, um, I remember the first day back to school from Christmas, right? What do you think the first thing was that all the kids talked about when they got back to school? It was that gift, right? That thing that you had been waiting for and longing for and waiting all year long for. And you got back to school and you told all of your friends about that gift. And yet I wonder as we think about this today, if Jesus truly is the ultimate gift, why we don't have that same excitement of sharing him in this season with our friends and people that we come in contact with. And so that's the challenge for us today. Is what will we do with this gift that God has given to us? How will we respond to this gift? Will we respond with excitement or will we just kind of put it on the shelf and not tell anybody else about it? I would encourage us today to think about that. Um, think about that this week as we have opportunities to share that together. So I'm going to pray for us and then Josh and Kayla are going to come up and lead us in one last song. Um, I'll be hanging out up front. If, if anybody uh, needs prayer or wants to talk about anything, I'll be up here um, for that as well. So let us pray. Father, thank you for the gift of Jesus. We thank you for, God, not only was Jesus um, sent, God, but he was, he was promised. He was the answer to years and years of waiting. And God, even in our own lives today, as we anticipate and wait for the return of Jesus, God, I pray that excitement, that anticipation would continue to grow, even in this Christmas season, that this hope, this thrill of hope that comes from Jesus would continue to to grow, grow in our lives. And we thank you for him this morning, God. I pray that for each one of us in this season that we would share this gift with those that have never experienced the joy that Jesus brings. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.